This episode of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Patreon supporters and listeners like you. If you enjoy Hellbent for Horror, please consider supporting the show by contributing either on our Patreon site or via PayPal. You can find links to both of those on hellbentforhorror.com. And I thank you for helping to sustain the show. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. Before I get into the show, I wanted to thank some listeners who decided to support Hellbent for Horror through Patreon. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to my website and click the support button. And if you follow me on Twitter, there's a link to my Patreon site on every episode post I do. And we give you stuff for your support, including your own personal direct play link for the episodes. So without further ado, I want to thank Tony Dixon, who joined at the werewolf level. Tony, we thank you for your support, and we wish you a lifetime of Wolfsbane free full moons. I also want to thank Casey Van Heis for supporting us at the Frankenstein level. Yes, there are different levels. Go look at the Patreon page to find out more. Hint, hint. As mentioned, Casey chose the Frankenstein level. Casey, we here at Hellbent for Horror like the way you think. So we've added your brain to the shortlist for inclusion in our new creature. Since you are so community-minded, Casey, we think it's only fair that your cranium be part of a creature made up of the body parts of a dozen criminals, I mean, fellow citizens. Now, Casey is relatively new to horror, and she sent me an email to thank me for the movie recommendations I give through the episodes. Casey mentioned how daunting it can be to enter a new genre, because there are so many movies and styles out there. And... Unfortunately, another reason is because not all the so-called gatekeepers are nice about letting new people enter. And hearing that always bothers me, because every alleged expert and every blog posting despot, including myself, started knowing nothing. Nobody got this stuff through osmosis. Just like the first time we heard rock and roll, there was a first time we saw a horror movie or read a horror story. And once we got a taste, we wanted more of that good stuff. And somebody pointed each of us in the right direction. Somebody let us through the gates. Somebody had to be our completely reliable bad influence. Today, I want to talk about one of my favorite bad influences during my teen years. That influence was a mongrel of a magazine that drew the ire of every PTA member in the country. It was a magazine that said it was okay to be a horror fan at a time when most of the world was saying that this stuff was what was wrong with society. Back in the early 1980s, horror fans were real misfits and real outcasts, much more so than today. We were mocked, we were misunderstood, and so was this magazine. When groups complained about the graphic violence, this magazine made a badge of honor out of gore, right on the front cover. It spoke to us, it spoke for us, and it was a horror fan's equivalent of Delta House. It was Fangoria Magazine. This year, 2017, feels like the year of eulogies. And on February 13th, 2017, Fangoria called it quits. Now, it didn't come as a complete surprise to diehard fans who paid for subscriptions but weren't seeing any new issues coming out. Still, when the official word came out, old fans who grew up with it sighed a deep sigh. For the first time since 1979, there would never be a new issue of Fangoria. However, the death of Fangoria is bittersweet. Many will call it the end of an era, but I think it's more like the conclusion of an experiment. And it was a successful experiment. Fangoria was the catalyst that gave horror, cult, and exploitation films a seat at the pop culture table. But it was also instrumental in elevating pop culture itself into the mainstream. Like a good catalyst, it created the reaction it was supposed to, and then burned out. But man, what a great reaction it was. A lot of the articles about the end of Fangoria, and there aren't that many, 
focus on how it helped popularize gore. And rightfully so. It was what made the magazine stand out, and it was their bread and butter. But those of us who read the magazine back in those early days knew that the gore was just a smokescreen to freak out the squares. Beneath all of that was the obsessive passion of writers and editors who were fans. And the writers brought all of the things they loved into each issue, and they evangelized those things to a whole generation of fans. I believe, consciously or unconsciously, the first 10 years of Fangoria magazine shaped the landscape of horror and cult and exploitation entertainment into what it is today. It rejuvenated interest in forgotten icons, and it created new icons who might have faded into anonymity. But, most importantly, it introduced elements from other subgenres into horror just as horror was about to have a huge resurgence. And the diversity of what topics the magazine covered in those early days would create new paths of discovery for readers. Readers who would grow up to make movies that would make those paths permanent fixtures in horror. Would Herschel Gordon Lewis be as well known and beloved if he wasn't given a showcase article in issue number four? Would the work of Dan Curtis, like Dark Shadows, still be as influential as it is if it weren't immortalized in issue number 17? Would Tom Savini, or Chris Wallace, or Stan Winston become superstars in their own right? Maybe. But the additional reason that I think Fangoria was so important was because of its distribution. The magazine was cheap and it was available in practically any town that had a bookstore. And that means that the knowledge inside each issue was easily available to anyone who wanted it. Fangoria had the opportunity to influence a huge number of fans. In the 1980s, Fangoria was the most prominent horror publication in the world. The funny part is that it wasn't intended to be a horror magazine. Publishing a magazine devoted to horror movies was not an original concept. Forrest J. Ackman's famous Monsters of Filmland, the first fanzine of them all, was devoted to monster movies. It was tremendously popular, and it spawned hundreds of magazines devoted to horror, science fiction, and fantasy. Castle of Frankenstein was another very popular horror magazine in the 1960s. But, for the most part, most of these genre magazines were devoted to science fiction. No small part of that was because Star Trek created a whole new level of fandom. Star Trek literally took fandom from guys sitting at home writing letters to Isaac Asimov to convention centers and national fan clubs. And those fans went on to create their own magazines and write science fiction. Two of those fans, Carrie O'Quinn and David Houston, wanted to make a magazine devoted entirely to Star Trek. However, Paramount Pictures demanded royalties that they couldn't afford. O'Quinn realized they didn't need to pay royalties if they wrote articles about Star Trek, but didn't make it the only focus of the magazine. And Starlog was born in 1976. And what about horror at that time? By 1976, Castle of Frankenstein had closed shop. Famous Monsters was still going strong, but Ackerman's focus remained with the classic horror films, and he dismissed any modern horror, and he wasn't the only one. Essentially, modern horror didn't have a place to call its own. Starlog would do articles on horror films that couldn't be ignored, like Dawn of the Dead, so at least there was some representation out there. And then, in 1978, Carrie O'Quinn decided to take a risk and start a companion magazine to Starlog. The magazine was named Fantastica, and it was going to be the first publication to capitalize on the next big genre explosion, and that was going to be fantasy films. Hey, it seems sensible enough. Dungeons and Dragons was very popular, and Ralph Bakshi released his version of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And a live-action movie of Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian was coming out in 1978, and Conan was going to change everything. Unfortunately, the Conan movie wouldn't get completed until 1982, and Lord of the Rings just wasn't enough to start a fantasy craze. Nevertheless, plans were already made, money was spent, and stories were written. If you read The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, or know the early history of Marvel Comics, you know how chaotic and seat-of-the-pants publishing can be. There are usually more letters in the word staff than there are members of the staff. And Fantastica's staff 
was no exception. First off, everyone was a floater working out of the Star Log office. On any given day, staff members would move to wherever the need was the greatest. Fantastica was just another assignment. For the first issue of Fantastica, the editor was the legendary Joe Bonham. The name not ringing any bells? Well, that's because it's an alias taken from the main character in Dalton Trumbull's Johnny Got His Gun. Joe Bonham was really Ed Naha, a writer for Rolling Stone who used the alias for professional reasons. The senior writer was Rick Myers, who wrote the book Martial Arts Movies from Bruce Lee to the Ninjas that popularized Asian cinema in the United States. And listed as associate editor on the first issue was Bob Martin. The list of contributors included Harold Bissonnet and Charles Bogle. Can't find their bibliographies on Wikipedia? No surprise. Both names are characters W.C. Fields played in his movies. Bob Martin made aliases so it seemed like there were more writers than there were. There were real people, however, like Ed Godzashevsky, a Godzilla expert, and a young Mick Garris. With all these talented people, Fantastica was set to conquer the world. And then the whole thing ran into a buzzsaw. As soon as Fantastica was announced in the trades, the publishers of a competing magazine, Fantastic Films Magazine, filed a lawsuit. They contended that the titles were similar enough to cause brand confusion. Production screeched to a halt for months while the court deliberated. The courts ruled in favor of Fantastic Films Magazine. So... In early 1979, the long-delayed Starlong Companion magazine was now without a name. During the delay from the legal battle, Bob Martin was promoted to editor. First order of business, get a name for this puppy so we can finally get it to print. Sometime during a late-night brainstorming session, somebody came up with Fangoria. And on July 31st, 1979, Fangoria was released on every newsstand that carried Starlog. I remember that first issue fondly. Godzilla was on the cover with a streetcar in his mouth and an atom bomb going off behind him. For me, that was an instant buy, a no-brainer. And yet, the first issue was a total failure at the newsstands. And so were the next five issues. Conventional wisdom says the magazine did so poorly because it blindly followed the original fantasy concept. And some of the early article choices were a little idiosyncratic. Both issue one and issue two feature articles about Doctor Who, which had a very small cult following at the time. But for every article about Battlestar Galactica's lost aliens or pages devoted to Dungeons and Dragons style artwork, there was an article on the Amityville Horror. The feature article was about Godzilla, and there was another article on the creature from the Black Lagoon. But... A three-page article on Tom Savini's work on Dawn of the Dead would prove to be the most significant story in the first issue. It came with stills from the film, most notably a photo of the exploding zombie head. We'll come back to the Tom Savini article in a moment. Now, this mashup of different genres in the first issue shows how broad their definition of fantasy was, but it also shows how they just didn't see horror as having its own identity yet. To be fair, this mashup of science fiction, fantasy, and horror wasn't that different from what made Starlog such a hit publication. And I think that was the problem. Why make a companion magazine that feels a lot like the original one? I think Cary O'Quinn overinvested in making his follow-up to Starlog a hit. The Starlog style, really his style, is all over Fangoria, with just a few tweaks here and there. Reminders of Starlog are all over the issue. Every few pages, there would be an ad for a subscription to Starlog, or there would be an ad to buy Starlog t-shirts. For even more deja vu, the ads were the exact same ones that were printed in Starlog. Even on the magazine's cover, written above the Fangoria masthead, were the words, Starlog Presents. As early as issue number two, O'Quinn was getting called out about the magazine's content in the fan mail. In a letter entitled More Fantasy, a reader quoted Carrie O'Quinn's Welcome to the World of Fangoria message from issue number one. O'Quinn promised that Fangoria would showcase fantasy that didn't fit the pages of Starlog. 
Yet, the reader says, the magazine only has articles on horror films. Will this fantasy magazine have any fantasy in it? About four issues in, Bob Martin gets dour news from the publisher. The magazine was losing $20,000 every issue, and this couldn't go on much longer. But all was not lost. In fact, that financial loss was going to allow Fangoria to finally reach its potential. Because when it looked like Fangoria was going to tank, O'Quinn and the other publishers distanced themselves from the magazine and left it in the hands of Bob Martin. I mean, how much trouble could a first-time, untested editor do before the money ran out? So, remember when I said we'd get back to the Tom Savini article? I didn't forget about that article. And neither did Bob Martin. Although the sales were very poor for the first issue, the audience that did read it gave universal praise for the Tom Savini article. The gory pictures certainly helped. But those stills already shocked people in a controversial article about George Romero in Starlog issue number 21, so the novelty wasn't there. What really sold the article was that Savini talked passionately about his theories on special effects and explained how he did them. That mixture of color pictures of splatter and behind-the-scenes talk with the working professionals were the key ingredients that would change Fangoria's fortunes. Bob Martin experimented with this concept again in issue number two when he wrote an in-depth piece on Don Coscarelli's Phantasm. And in my opinion, this is when Uncle Bob Martin was born. So, say you're a teenager and you open the magazine to the first article. You see a two-page spread for a movie you've never heard of and it has a title that you're not even sure you can pronounce. There's a picture of a kid free-falling through a red sky, and another picture with a dead guy who oozes yellow blood from his mouth. And then, the first words in the article are these. Reader warning! Do not read this article until you have seen Phantasm. Much of the information to follow concerning the film's plot and special effects could diminish the pleasure of a first viewing of this unique film. Pow! What a setup. P.T. Barnum and William Cass will be proud. It was pure pro wrestling bravado. What teenager is not going to see that as a challenge? Now, if you're me, you think, well, I'll just turn the page and see what's there. And the picture that was there was the moment that Fangoria made its first move towards its true potential. The large picture shows a man in close-up, screaming, while some type of metal sphere with sharp blades embeds in his forehead, and the sphere has a drill bit that is boring a hole into his skull right between his eyes. Blood pours from the wound over the man's face, down his lips, and you can see his screaming reflection on the blood-drenched sphere. There are no shadows to hide anything. The image is so clear that you can see the flesh tearing right around the drill bit. Now, compared to all the carnage that would follow over the next 38 years, it's not that shocking. But 38 years ago, there had never been a picture that graphic, that shocking, that surreal in a magazine that you could buy at your nearby Walden Books. Most magazines got away with some bloody stuff by printing photos in black and white. This was full color and full page. It wasn't just the picture, though, that made this memorable. It was the delivery, and it was the warning, and it was the presence of mind not to put that picture on the first page of the article, but instead make the reader turn the page and then get the shock, just like a horror movie. Now, I'm not going to soft-pedal the gore, especially since it was deliberately done to provoke a response. Gore had existed long before Fangoria, but it was hidden from people like us, teenagers. As Bob Martin once said, the censors think that 15-year-olds are afraid of stage blood. Seeing that gore for the first time in a magazine was crossing a forbidden line. It was a rebellious thrill. It was weirdly liberating. But that initial shock and that gore was just the carrot at the end of the stick. We weren't just hardcore fans for the gore, we were hardcore fans for information. 
And I think that's something that got missed by people. Sure, we wanted to see the gore, but we also wanted to know how the effect was done and who created it and what else that person did in other movies. And we wanted to know who influenced that person and what movies they loved because we were very aware that this stuff wasn't real and we loved the illusion. The article was in-depth and well-written and full of how movie magic happens. This was written by someone who is not only a fan of horror, but a fan of movie making. And the article was a hit. Uncle Bob tried the same approach in issue number three. Right after a painfully long article on the 1979 remake of Arabian Adventure, re remember that? I don't. It was an interview with David Cronenberg for his new film, The Brood. The picture at the front of the article showed a group of mutated children wearing blood-spattered onesies hovering over a bloody dead body. Absolutely creepy and absolutely mesmerizing. And when you turn the page, there's a picture of actress Samantha Eggert licking the blood off a newborn fetus like a dog would lick a newborn pup clean. And your stomach does a quick lurch. And then you got to read the article to figure out what this shit is all about. Fan response is going through the roof over these in-depth articles on movies that most magazines would ignore. One fan letter read, Thank you for giving us an intelligently written color magazine. Maybe now we can read about all the movies that have been overlooked or ignored entirely by magazines of this nature. Films like The Exorcist, The Omen, Burnt Offerings, and Halloween are well known, but were never covered in depth elsewhere. Fangoria had found a demand that wasn't being met and that they could supply. Modern horror of any budget level and any gore level was worth discussion. And with that, Fangoria found its signature style. Not everyone was happy with Fangoria's signature style. One angry letter in issue 5 entitled No More Gore said there were too many bloody color photographs. Every issue there are bloody pics of heads exploding and cannibalism. I wish you would stop. This reaction was coming before Fangoria really started to push the envelope. In retrospect, this was tame. This was back when the gore was still hidden inside the magazine. Which reminds me of a letter from a new reader who had asked his mom to pick up the new star log for him. Accidentally, she brought home Fangoria for him instead. In less than a year, there's no way in hell any mother in the world would make that mistake. The gore may have been the obvious signature style, but there was a subtler and more influential one in the first decade of Fangoria. Even in the gore heyday of the slasher films, there was always a diversity to what was covered. There was always something that increased your horror education. Take issue 36, published in the middle of the slasher craze. The cover has a picture from Friday the 13th, the final chapter, where a guy is getting his head cut off with a hacksaw, blood everywhere. But inside the issue is a two-part, eight-page tribute to Boris Karloff and an article on British cult film director Roy Ward Baker and an article about Bert I. Gordon, King of the Giant Animal movies from the 1950s and the 1960s. There was also a regular feature called The Official Fango Library, which recommended reference books and movie memoirs and video guides so you could learn more. And there was a very pointed essay about the politics behind the special makeup Oscar, just a year after the first Oscar was given to American Werewolf in London, essentially biting the hand that feeds. And we loved when this magazine snapped at those institutions that ignored us for years. From Bob Martin to Ed Naha to Dave Everett, all the writers love their subjects, and they love to share it with readers. The breakthrough was issue number seven, which showcased Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. This is where the training wheels came off. You can tell because it's the first issue that removed the Star Log Presents logo at the top. It's also the first issue that made a profit. That issue is textbook Fangoria. Stanley Kubrick's The Shining sat right next to William Lustig's Maniac, which sat right next to Hammer Film's The Curse of Frankenstein, which sat next to an article about animator Chuck Jones, which sat right next to a retrospective on Alfred Hitchcock. And that's when the fans started to flock to Fangoria. 
The writers and editors tackled their subjects with reverence and with humor. And once the magazine got its sea legs and the staff grew confident, they embraced an anarchic attitude. All the way back in issue number six, Uncle Bob flirted with gore on the cover. On the cover, there's this cute picture of R2-D2 and C-3PO from The Empire Strikes Back that takes up most of the cover. And then, in the lower left-hand corner, is a little picture of a guy with an arrow through his eye and blood all over him. That was our introduction to Friday the 13th. Now, it might seem like old hat after all the slasher films and the sequels, but when it first came out, the original Friday the 13th was horror's version of punk rock. It was rude, and it was crude, and it threw all the movie rules about taste right out the window, and it didn't care what anyone thought of it. As horror fans, we loved the anarchy. As an editor, Bob Martin embraced it and put a little anarchy in the cover. There was some outrage. When director John Landis wrote Fangoria to thank the staff for interest in his upcoming American Werewolf in London, he had to voice concern. He said, Gore, for its own sake, grows quickly tiresome. Please try to refrain from printing the most gruesome stills you can get your hands on. Some weren't so polite. Dear Fangoria, started one reader's letter, there is, or used to be, a distinction between horror films and atrocity films, a distinction Gene Siskel seems to understand a whole lot better than you do. If the distinction is ever reestablished and the domains of nightmare are reclaimed from the gore mongers, it will be thanks to people like him, no thanks at all to your sort. And... As watchdog groups protested the amorality of Friday the 13th, the safe move would have been to wait out the storm. But instead, Fangoria upped the ante with issue number nine. Taking up most of the cover was a man wearing a bloody pig's head, holding the longest bladed chainsaw ever made, which was dripping with fresh blood. It was a still from the movie Motel Hell. I remember going to my local Walden Books and heading towards where I knew Fangoria was, seeing the cover and turning on my heels with a whoa. It was a shock to the system. It felt like a dirty secret of mine was uncovered. There was no hiding what was in that book anymore. I seriously thought I might not be able to buy it because the backlash against that garbage was real and people weren't shy about telling you what they thought. And that's when my training wheels came off. Of course I bought the damn magazine. The louder the protests got, the gorier the covers got. There was the cover with intestines blowing out of the television set from Videodrome. There was the drill through the head from Gates of Hell. There was the zombie missing his lower jaw from Day of the Dead. Soon the name Fangoria was being said as much by its detractors as it was by its fans. And I noticed that my bookstore moved Fangoria right next to the adult magazine section, right by the cash register. It was literally being treated like porn. And even with all that, the readership kept growing. But the anarchic spirit wasn't just about gory covers. The staff was emboldened by their success, and they started to bring more cult and off-the-wall subjects into the mix. There were articles about different horror hosts across the country. The films of John Waters were showcased. New York underground film director Nick Zed was mentioned. Heavy metal and punk rock were weaved into the horror mix. Johnny Ramone used to be a frequent visitor to the Fangoria offices. And pro wrestling got weaved into the DNA of the magazine. Uncle Bob Martin was a pro wrestling fan and he'd sprinkle stories about wrestlers in his Imagination Inc. column. When readers would complain about wrestling, he would reply in pro wrestler heel character and tell them off. And he also introduced the readers to the Mexican horror wrestling films of Santo and the Luchadores. Before Fangoria, horror didn't mix with any of this. Now, these are all accepted subgenres. WWE Studios, anyone? 
I'm not saying that Fangoria was directly responsible for these subgenres, but I will say that the magazine was indirectly responsible for making them possible. They were just another part of the constant discovery that was taking place on those pages. And I think it stuck in some of the readers' minds, and they grew up to be directly responsible for making the subgenres. And the writers weren't taking this seriously, and their irreverence was appealing. In issue number 21, they not only showcased John Waters and Mexican horror wrestling, but they also introduced a census report to fill out. This realistic-looking form was from the Vampire Research Center, which entreated you to fill out the form if you were a vampire. And Uncle Bob wrote stories under a manly alter ego named Brick Thornshaw, who would extol the virtues of sports and denigrate the magazine's content. There was a lot of hate mail for Brick Thornshaw. But it wasn't all silliness. Starting all the way back in issue number two, Bob Martin railed against the movie rating system. He stated that there was too large of a gap between PG and R ratings, and teenage horror fans were discriminated against because someone didn't think they could handle stage blood. He suggested a new rating somewhere in between PG and R to rectify that. But the focus of the magazine stayed the same. Fangoria sincerely wanted to include everything possible that was horror-related into the magazine. They reported on anything and everything that they heard about. Movies or television, it didn't matter. Novels or reference books, it didn't matter. Established makeup artists like Dick Smith or unknowns like Joe Blasco, it didn't matter. If they knew about it, they wanted you to know about it. Sometimes, this led to retractions and letdowns. Looking back through old issues, there are articles about movies that never materialized and interviews with artists who were never heard from again. In issue number nine, there was an article entitled Conan, a progress report. It looks like it's finally going to happen, guys. It does, two years later. By the time Conan does get released, Fangoria is cemented as the premier horror publication in the world. In the beginning, the only industry notices they got was B-movie director Jim Wynorski writing to complain about how sloppy the reporting was. Jim was a contributor just a few issues later. But Fangoria helped popularize a lot of artists that would normally have been anonymous. And those guys graciously returned the favor by giving interviews about their new gigs and recommending people to talk to the staffers. Who helped out who at that time is a toss-up, really. Did Fangoria help popularize the splatter craze, or did the splatter craze give Fangoria something to latch on to? Either way, by the mid-1980s, the artists in the studio saw the benefit of Fangoria's endorsement. It was common to see directors like John Carpenter reading Fangoria in a photo op directly from his movie set. By the 1990s, Fangoria was making films under its own production company, and was sponsoring conventions like Weekend of Horror, and even had a comic book line. So, what happened? Well, there are all sorts of reasons for Fangoria's demise. With the advent of digital media and a huge amount of online competition, Fangoria had trouble getting ad revenue to cover the cost of printing. And there was a rapid succession of editors after decades of stability with Bob Martin and his successor, Tony Timpone. But I think Fangoria was a catalyst that did what it was supposed to do and then burned out. It caused a reaction that helped horror become a little more popular, if not more respectable. It helped educate a generation by not only showing the future of horror, but also keeping the rich history of horror topical when there wasn't a lot of attention put there. I learned about Jimmy Sangster and Terrence Fisher and John Waters and Andy Milligan and Ramsey Campbell and countless others just because my hometown had a bookstore. A whole generation, not just a select few people in big cities, were able to get a film school level education about obscure delights all at the same time. Distribution, man. You can't discredit the influence that can have. And I think that influence is part of Fangoria's demise. It did its job so well educating and influencing a generation or two that it built the competition that killed it. But hey, 38 years was a good run. But that doesn't mean I'm done learning. Fangoria gave me a taste of the good stuff, but now I want more. I am eagerly looking for the next gatekeeper. Hey, you, point the way.
And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. You can find Hellbent for Horror on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And H4H has its own app. You can download it from the Google or Amazon store for Android, and the iPhone version is available on the iTunes store. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay hell-bent. <laughs>